I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After you state your name, please press the pound key. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After you state your name, please press the pound key. So question two, have you ever struggled to engage your colleagues with the charts you've created? So if that again resonates with you and you can answer yes to that, please raise your hand again. Quite a few hands. Good. So thank you for that. It sounds like for many of you this is a topic that is part of your daily work and that's exactly why we are here today. Measurement and data are key parts of our health system, and as a community, we are growing in our understanding and comfort with using measurement to support our quality improvement work. But there are still opportunities to learn more about how to present the data and engage people um, in our data to ask questions and spur further action. So as many of you know, my colleague Doug Campbell presented a session on measurement and data in the fall. His presentation walked you through the steps of identifying metrics and in collecting data, and I want to build on that presentation today and take it to the next step. Once you have your data, how do you most effectively present it and communicate it? So specifically, this is what I plan to focus on today. I want to start with the why and discuss why visual display is important. I'll then get into the how and what, and we'll discuss the five general types of charts and when to use each type. We'll then look at the basic principles for presenting data, the do's and don'ts. Throughout the presentation, I will share with you some examples from my own work, as well as we will try and do some group interaction to get you thinking about how best to display certain types of data. And so we will analyze a chart to determine if it meets guidelines and suggest ways of improving the visual display. Okay, so we'll get started with the first topic. Why visual display of data counts? Why does it matter? So I want everyone to think about the following scenario, one which you as health professionals I'm sure are familiar with. Imagine you're in a professional meeting, at a lecture, attending grand rounds, or in a daily huddle, and you are awaiting the explanation of the results of an important study or quality improvement initiative. The presenter arrives and is armed with a number of slides that they display. You can tell that they have something important to share and they are excited and passionate about the results. Just one problem, as they start presenting their work, virtually all of the visuals are a mess. There are mysterious graphics with lines running everywhere, bright colors that you know signify something but you don't know what, and lots of data that have no apparent interpretable results. You think to yourself, what is the take home message here? What is this information telling me? And what am I supposed to do with it? We are bombarded with information every day through work, through social media, entertainment, and in all of our day to day interactions. Some of that information is clear and concise and we know immediately what to do or what to think when we see it. Other times, we see visual displays of information and our first reaction is confusion. <coughs> we wonder how am I possibly supposed to make sense of this? What is it telling me and what am I supposed to do about it? It leads to confusion, frustration, disengagement, and a lot of time spent trying to interpret information. It can also lead to embarrassing and potentially troubling outcomes. So healthcare is no different. We go to a lot of effort in our quality improvement work in designing data systems, in identifying measures and data to collect, and engaging people to collect that data. And we have a responsibility to furthering this work in presenting the results in a clear and concise manner that evokes curiosity and drives further action. And I think this quote highlights it best. 
The careful acquisition of solid data and measurements of quality improvement is a fine thing, but even the most compelling results can be nullified by poor displays of data. So how we present our information is crucial. I can't tell you how many times I've had someone give me a number or information and I've responded with the question, is that good? Numbers are only meaningful in comparison. When we are presenting information, it's most meaningful if it can be presented in a way that allows you to understand what that number means. So with a target or in comparison to something else. When we are looking at data, we're looking for patterns and information that helps us ask questions and think about what to do next. Um, I, I won't be huddling just because I'm on this Webex, Webex thing. Hi, hey, sorry, just to remind everyone, if you're on the call, please press star, star six to mute so that we can't hear your background noise. Welcome, Snell. <laughs> I know, I recognize you. So that is your motivation for why this is important, and I'm sure you have your own motivation for being here as well. Visual display is important because we want to put numbers to work, we want to turn data into information, we want to communicate, and we want our measurement work to be valuable and useful and lead to action. So that's the why. Now let's talk about what we do and how we do that. So there are many ways to display and analyze data. In improvement work, visual displays of data are usually the best way to learn. And the first step is identifying what tool you'll use to display your information. There are five basic types of charts, and the next few slides go over those basic types and when it is appropriate to use each kind. Just something to note as I move forward, I do try and be consistent in the following slides and use the word chart when I'm describing the various tools you can use to visually display data. You may see sometimes, though, that the word graph is being used, and I just want you to know that I consider those two words to be interchangeable in this presentation. So how do you know which chart to choose? That depends on the purpose of the data. Good data analysis begins with clarifying the question being asked. This is a key step in designing your measurement system, and if you spend time and do that early work well, it will make all of your downstream steps, like choosing the proper chart, easier. If you clearly understand what your question is, it will go a long way in helping you understand and select what type of chart to use. <coughs> so the first general type of chart, charts are charts that display data over time. These are used in healthcare often, but also in all aspects of our life, as seen in the line chart here depicting weather patterns over time. And so these are strong tools for looking at changes and trends over time. A common way to present data over time is with a run chart. This is an example of a run chart where we have added a median to our line chart, and it's a very common quality improvement tool in healthcare. I see examples of these all the time when I'm walking the halls of our health facilities, and I'm sure you've all been exposed to this type of chart in your work as well. You've either seen them um, where you work or you've had a role in creating and interpreting them. So run charts present data over time and are one of the most important tools in quality improvement work for assessing the effectiveness of change. They have a variety of benefits. So run charts can help improvement teams formulate aims by depicting how well a process is performing or how poorly it's performing. They help to determine when changes are truly improvements. And they can give direction as you work on information or improvements and provide information about the value of particular changes. So when do you use a run chart? You can use a run chart to view data over time, to display data to make process performance visible, to understand variation, to determine if we are holding the gains made by our improvement, and to determine if a change is truly an improvement. So there are whole books and courses on run charts, and we could talk about them uh, for the whole presentation. There are specific rules that you use to help you analyze whether your data, as displayed in a run chart, truly represents a change or improvement. We aren't going to touch on those today, but I have included some resources at the end of the presentation that you may find useful if you are creating or interpreting run charts. So 
data over time is a good way to present dy dynamic data when you do have that time element. The second type of general type of charts are distribution charts. These are charts that show the shape and spread of data and are typically looking at static data or data at one point in time. So these, in, these include things like a pie chart, a histogram, a Pareto chart, or a stem and leaf plot. And these type of charts are again very common in healthcare and they're often used for understanding the frequency of data. You can use these types of charts to display large amounts of data that are difficult to interpret in tabular form to show the relative frequency and occurrence in various data values. You can use them to reveal the centering, spread, and variation of the data and to illustrate the underlying distribution of that data. One very common type of distribution chart is a Pareto chart. And it's a tool that allows you to break a problem down into its parts and identify what are the most important. A Pareto chart typically shows two main pieces of information. So the bars highlight the volume of specific factors, and then on the secondary y-axis, we have the percent of how much each of those factors contributes to the total. So in healthcare, we often talk about the Pareto principle, or the 80-20 rule which typically states that 80% of the effects come from 20% of the causes. And a Pareto chart can help you visually display that. So in this example, we're looking at the causes of discharge delay from the emergency room. On the x-axis, we plot the causes, and on the primary y-axis, we're looking at the count or occurrence of each of those causes. But on the secondary y-axis, we have the percent that each of these causes contributes to the overall problem. So you can see that we get 80% of the issue from the two most frequent causes, x-rays and bed shortage. A Pareto chart shows which category is the biggest contributor to a problem. It shows what are the other contributors to a problem, and it helps you understand if the problem is concentrated to a few issues or spread over a number of issues. And you can use the Pareto chart when you know the causes to a problem and you're trying to break a problem into its categories. They're also very useful to help you um, try and prioritize resources. And so we see these charts used a lot in healthcare when teams are trying to identify what is perhaps the biggest contributing factor to a problem and help them focus their improvement efforts in an area they know they can have the biggest impact. So this is the third type of general chart, and this is a relationship chart, which shows the relationship between different characteristics. So examples of these charts include a response plot, or a line plot, or a scatter plot, which is the chart seen here. These types of charts provide a visual display of the relationship between two variables, showing how one variable increases or decreases as another increases or decreases. And these types of charts are used to help investigate whether one variable is influenced by another. And they can be very useful when you're trying to answer the following questions. How are two variables related? Are there any patterns to this relationship? When one variable changes, how does the other change? And does there appear to be a potential correlation where changes in one variable relate to changes in another? So next we have the fourth general type of chart, and this is what's called a locations chart. It can also be referred to as a measles chart or a concentration chart. And it shows the distribution of a problem or condition across some space, like a physical layout or a geographic area. And we often see these used in healthcare also as a data collection form. So for example, in a long-term facility where you're trying to identify where patient falls happen in the facility. And so it can help you visually see the issue and the concentration of that issue. And here's another example of a measles chart. And we often see charts like this uh, presented in the news, and it's showing how one area of the country compares to another area of the country in terms of a specific measurement. So finally, we have the multiple measures chart. 
And an example of this is a radar chart, also known as a spider diagram. And these can be very useful in project planning, and we are starting to see them used more and more in the Saskatchewan healthcare system in project planning. And these charts enable you to show the gaps between your current performance area and your ideal performance area. So in project planning, you can outline all of the various components of a project that have to be addressed. And you highlight your current state or where you are now and where you need to be at the end of your project. And by highlighting your current state and your future state, you can highlight the gaps that exist. And it helps you communicate what resources or planning is needed to get you from your current state to that ideal future state. Just one important point to make, if this is something you use, keep in mind that you want the factors that you place on your radar chart to be comparable. So you want to be comparing apples to apples. So those are the five general types of charts. And what I have on this slide here is just a summary of those five general types of charts, an example of each, and then a quick description on when you typically want to use them. So in summary, we have five general types of charts. We have data over time, an example is a run chart, and the typical use is to study variation over time. We have charts that display distribution, example a frequency chart like a histogram to study location and spread or, which we saw in the slides, a Pareto chart, which will help you study where um, the biggest impact is and which factors are contributing the most to your problem. We have charts that display a relationship. An example is the scatter plot, which allows you to study the relationship between two variables. We have location charts, like a measles chart, and we have multiple measures charts, like a radar chart. So these, of course, aren't the only types of charts there are, but they are some of the most common types and ones we see used in healthcare often. So now I'd like to run through a few examples and see, based on what we just discussed, which chart do you think is the better choice given a certain question or issue you're trying to solve? So we are hoping this will be interactive. Okay, um, so we are hoping this will be interactive using the show of hand tools again. So I will read a scenario, and then it will be like multiple choice, and I'll give you two options. I'll read both of our options um, once over, and then I'll read them over again and allow you to vote in between each of those options. And so you can vote by using the hand tool. So I'll read option A, and if you think it should be option A, you can raise your hand. And then I'll read option B, and if you think it um, should be option B, you can raise your hand for that. So scenario one, let's say you are working on a quality improvement project focusing on falls reduction. You spent a lot of time implementing a plan for reducing the number of falls on a hospital unit, and you want to track the progress of your work over time and understand how your initiative is impacting your goal of reducing falls. So would you use option A, a, a chart that shows the distribution of your data, or would you use option B, a run chart to show your data over time? So for those of you that think you should use option A, please raise your hand. Okay, and for those of you who think you should use option B, data over time, please raise your hand. Great, um, so pretty straightforward and I would agree with everyone that this is an example where data over time um, is the best way to present your data. A run chart would allow you to view the data over time and understand the impact of our changes. It'll help identify what is working and where further opportunities are needed. Okay, so if you want to take your hand down and we'll move on to question two. So you're in the early stages of project planning and you're trying to identify your highest volume care areas to understand where to focus your resources to have the biggest impact on patient volume. What type of chart would you use to show this and help you understand your priorities areas based on patient volume? So would you use option A, a distribution plot, like a Pareto chart, or option B, a relationship plot, like a scatter plot? So if you think option A, uh, please raise your hand. Great, so I see a few hands going up. And then if you think option B, please raise your hand. 
Okay, so I think the majority of you um, said option A, uh, Pareto charts, and I would agree with that, or a distribution plot. And this would be a good example of using a Pareto chart to help you understand the areas in the hospital that have the highest patient volume, which is one factor you could use to understand where to focus your QI project or resources. And this is where the 80-20 rule would be useful. And you can use the chart and the rule to understand the patient care areas where the majority of your volume comes from. So finally, our last example. Um, you're trying to address patient experience and do some exploratory work and understand what factors are related to the patient experience. Based on other data you've seen, literature you've read, and anecdotal information you've heard, you have a hunch that there's a strong relationship between patient experience and length of stay, and you want to validate this with your own data. Which type of chart would you use to show if there is in fact a relationship between these two variables? So option A, a multiple measures chart, like a radar chart, or option B, a relationship chart, like a scatter plot. So if you think option A, please raise your hand now. And if you think option B, a relationship plot, please raise your hand. Great, um, so three for three, I would agree with everyone that option B, a relationship chart, specifically a scatter plot, can help you understand if there is a relationship between patient experience and length of stay. So these are just a few examples I wanted to walk through to help you understand the thought process you have when you're trying to identify what type of tool to use. It comes down to what is the question you're trying to answer and what is the data you're trying to communicate. Sometimes it will be relatively straightforward and other times you'll have to do a bit of exploration to figure out the best chart that fits. So just to further emphasize the importance for picking the right chart, I'd like to give you an example from my own work. So I've been involved in the Saskatchewan Acute Stroke Pathway and this work is focusing on improving a number of areas with stroke care. One of the goals is to improve communication between rural health regions and specialists that are located in urban centers through the use of telehealth technology. As this is a very important goal of the pathway, we want to track how we're doing. And so we identified one of our metrics as the percent of patient situations that use telestroke, which is our telehealth technology, to consult with a neurologist. So what chart do we use to display the results? So here are a few things we considered. We're piloting the improvement work over a period of time. This is a new process that requires training and infrastructure. In the current culture, telehealth is rarely used for these consults, and since telestroke is a new technology, it's not used at all. We predict that it will take time for clinicians to become comfortable with this technology, and we anticipate that the uptake will improve over time. And there is significant value for patients and for the health system to have this technology in place working. So we want to track our data over time and see how our implementation plan is doing in meeting our goal. So it's data over time, and the best way we could represent this data is through a run chart. So I'm going to return to this example as we move forward and talk about what to do and what not to do when creating this type of chart. So this is the end of the first section. We've talked about why visual display of data is important, and we've started talking about how we display our data by discussing what chart to use in what situation. There will be lots of time for discussion at the end, but are there any burning questions people feel have to be addressed now before we move forward? Okay, so then I will move on to the next section, and we're going to talk about good graphical methods. So once you pick the chart you're going to use, what are some good guiding principles to use to present the data and create that chart? So I can't really talk about graphical excellence without mentioning Edward Tufte. He's a leader in this field and has been called the Leonardo da Vinci of data. He's written a number of books on the topic of visual display of data. These are very engaging books, and if anyone is interested in them, I provide a link to Tufty's website in the references at the end of the slide deck. Tufty said that 
a well-designed presentation of interesting data is a matter of statistics, substance, and design. So statistics is what we've already talked about and what Doug talked about in the previous presentation. It's about selecting the right data and the right way to present that data. Substance and integrity talks about how you present the data. You want to provide important information, but never mislead what your data is saying by how you present it. So I've sometimes had people in my own work who, after I've presented data to them about a project we're working on, have said, ooh, can't you present that in a different way so it doesn't look as negative? You don't want to game the system to make the data look good, although you will see that people often do. Finally, Tufti's design principle says to use the least ink to present the greatest amount of information in the smallest space. This is the idea that every piece of information that is included on your chart is necessary and important and adds to your story. And so as we move forward, you will see how this is often ignored. And if, in a few slides, we will see charts that have unnecessary decoration and wasted ink. So the challenge when presenting data is to create visual displays that maximize our learning. How do we do this? And so here are a few guiding principles to keep in mind when creating your charts. And the following few slides present the what to do. And these show charts that are examples of strong displays of data. So the first guiding principle is that effective charts are clear. They are well labeled with access titles and annotations where appropriate. The data that is being presented are clear and each mark on the page serves a purpose to tell the story of the data. Effective charts are accurate. At first glance with this chart, it looks like there has been a strong slope upwards on the far right side of the chart. When we look closely at the y-axis, though, we see that the scale only goes from 3 to 9 percent. And so it's quite misleading in how the data are being presented. When we change the scale, we see um, that the scale that's being used has a significant impact on how we perceive the data and what we take away from it. Another guiding principle is that effective charts are clean. Remember, Tufti says that we should use the least ink to present the greatest amount of information in the smallest space. We don't want to clutter our charts with any unnecessary lines or words, but have just the right amount of information to tell the story of the data. So finally, effective charts are meaningful. Here we have an example of multiple run charts presenting the same data. The chart at the top left presents data for the whole province, and the rest of the chart drills down into the same metrics for each um, Saskatchewan health region. So the data are presented in a way that flow and makes sense. Okay, so now moving on. We've talked about what to do. Now let's look at what you shouldn't do. I'm sure you can all think of examples in your own life where you've seen charts that are not presented in the best way you think they could. I'm going to share a few examples that I've seen with you now. So when I first look at this, I'm overwhelmed. Nice colors, but what am I supposed to take away from this chart? What is it telling me? Ineffective charts are confusing, and this pie chart is just hideous. There are way too many categories for you to take away anything meaningful. This would have been better. It's presenting the same information, but in a different way. At least now we know what the question is, and we can clearly see the answer to that question of who has the most Twitter accounts. Here's another example of a confusing chart. This chart, again, is overwhelming, and there's too much information being presented for you to make any clear conclusions. The data are far too numerous, and whatever story you're telling is lost. Ineffective charts are also inaccurate. Remember, how you present your scales is important. And one way to create a false impression is to change the scale partway through an access. So this chart, originally from the Washington Post, attempts to compare the income of doctors to other professionals from 1939 to 1976. And it surely conveys the impression that doctors' incomes increased about linearly, with some slowdown in the later years. But if you look closer, the years do not increase in the same values. 
So the years at the beginning have a large gap. We go from 1939 to 1947 to 1951, so cover a span of over 10 years with three data points. As we move to the right into the later years, we start going up year by year, so 1972, 73, 74. The presenter distorts the story by changing the axis. So a redrawing of the chart with year values spaced appropriately gives an entirely different message. Doctor's income now appears to have increased exponentially, while the incomes of other professionals seem to have increased linearly. And the annotation of the date when Medicare starts adds a whole other element, and now, with the data being portrayed fairly, we can interpret accordingly. So here's another big don't. Ineffective charts are noisy. They do ridiculous, although entertaining, things like make the display of data 3D, even when the data are not three-dimensional. Decorative features like this are not needed and can often distract your reader from the real story. So here's the data, or the same data, presented in a different way. Is this not much easier to understand? There's no 3D information, and there's no distracting grid lines. Here's another example of a noisy chart, an example when decorative information adds nothing. This data is surrounded by a pointless border that takes up space, is distracting, and adds no value. So here's an image with, that has been shared with me as one of the most misleading charts ever published. Even though it's an older image now, it provides a great example of more um, what not to do than ever seen in one image. So the cover story, why does college have to cost so much, shows a large chart superimposed on a scene from the Cornell campus, a college in the United States. There are two jagged lines running across the chart, one in black at the top labeled Cornell's tuition, and the other, the pink line, labeled Cornell's ranking. The tuition chart shows a steady rise, and the ranking chart, after some early variation, plummets to an all-time low. And the clear impression that the magazine wants the reader to get is that students are paying more for far less. So what's wrong with that image? More careful reading of the whole article reveals a very different story. So in the images here, um, the tuition chart is at the top and the ranking chart is below. So problem one, the ranking chart covers an 11-year period, while the tuition chart covers 35 years. Yet they are shown simultaneously and have the same apparent width on the horizons, horizontal scale. So problem two, the vertical scale for tuition and ranking could not possibly have common units. Tuition would be in some sort of financial uh, unit, and the ranking is a numerical value. But the ranking chart is placed under the tuition chart, creating the impression that cost exceeds quality. And so finally, problem three, and here's the most interesting thing. The sharp drop in the ranking chart over the past few years actually represents the fact that the university's rank has improved from a low of 15 to a high of 6. So there are so many things not to do in this chart. And you can see how the creator tries to mislead the reader and engage them in a story that is very different than what the data actually say. <coughs> so finally, ineffective charts are pointless. They don't, us allow to they don't allow us to connect with data in a meaningful way. Use data as a conversation starter and not to state the obvious. Don't create charts when a table would do, and don't create charts when a single sentence would work. So practically, what does this mean for you? I hope you found a bit of humor in these examples and learned a few things about what to do and what not to do when creating your chart. Thinking about the do's and don'ts though, what are some guidelines that you can use for creating your chart? And if the goal is we want to create a chart, we want to create charts that are clear, accurate, clean, and meaningful. And we want to avoid charts that are confusing, inaccurate, noisy, and pointless. And so with those guiding principles in mind, here are some tangible tips for successful data display to, to try and accomplish that goal. Black and white is beautiful. If you don't need color, don't add color. Minimize your chart lines, including the grid lines, and all other colors and extra lines on your chart. 
Annotate your chart to help tell the story, but don't clutter. If it makes sense, like in a run chart or with data over time, connect your data points. Scale your data so that they take up 50 to 60% of this chart. Have just enough white space in your chart so that it's clean and clear. Ensure appropriate axes. Remember, don't try and game your data through changing an inappropriate axes. So what do people think about this graph? Considering what we just learned, is this clear? Is it accurate? Is it clean? And is it meaningful? So this is where um, I'd love to hear from you. If you want to unmute your phone and if you have any thoughts on ways we can make this chart better and more effective, uh, please let us know. So does anyone have any thoughts on how we could clean this up? Hello, this is Starlene from Five Hills. Hi. Um, you could take the 3D away. You could Absolutely. Get rid of some of those grid lines so you wouldn't be so cluttered. Absolutely. I think the grid lines are important, but we can fade them into the background so they're not the first thing you see. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I think we could have potentially have a better title at the top, so we better convey what we're measuring. We can have a la better label on the y-axis, so we clearly know what we're counting. And then there is a legend there, but it's sort of in an awkward spot, so I think we can move that and better explain what the various colored bars are. So this is an example of a chart that a lot of things could be done to make it um, cleaner, clearer, more accurate, and more meaningful. Hi, this is Starlene again. I forgot this should also be a run chart. You, you can see, yep, that uh, they're presenting the data at the bottom in time. So this is an example where we would question, is this even the best type of chart to use exactly? Thank you. Okay, so I just want to emphasize the point further and the importance of having a strong chart. So I want to return to my example with the stroke pathway. So remember, I'm working with the acute stroke pathway, and one of the metrics we're capturing is the percent of patient situations that use telestroke, our telehealth technology, to consult with a neurologist. And we decided to present the data over time with a run chart. So I'm going to sort of show you the process I went through for creating a, a run chart. Something to note, the data on the following slides are fictitious and for example purposes only. So here's my first attempt. Right away, it's not clear. My eyes aren't drawn to the data points, they're drawn to the grid lines. So I need to make the actual data stand out and the other information fade into the background. So I've lightened the grid lines and this makes the actual data points stand out. Next, we know this is data over time and as appropriate with a run chart, we can connect the data points. So this is starting to look a bit better. The data stands out and it's what your eyes are drawn to. Something that stands out though for me, and I'm guessing for everyone else, is the data points at point seven. Obviously something happened here, and to make the data clearer and more meaningful, we can add an annotation. Additionally, you may notice that our axis only goes up to 12%, and it makes it really look like we have a strong slope upwards, which can be a bit misleading. Finally, if we remember the notion that our data should take up to 50 to 60% of the chart, we have some work to do. You can see here that our data are taking up the full chart and we'd like to fix that. So here's the next attempt. The chart is more meaningful as we add detail to the story of the data. There was an equipment malfunction which made it impossible to use even if it was appropriate. I changed the axis so it goes from zero to 25% rather than 12% and the data are no longer taking up the whole chart. Another thing that's missing though is a bit more explanation of what this chart is telling us. So we need more titles and labels. So here's the final chart that I would be comfortable using. I've added labels to the x-axis so we know we're talking about months. And I've added a label on the y-axis show, showing that we're capturing percent. There is a more detailed title and a note in the top left corner of the chart showing that our goal is to see the data line increase. I've also added a median line, which makes this a run chart, and a legend clearly outlining what data is what. 
So we went from this to this. And I think I make, made the chart um, cleaner, clearer, more accurate, and more meaningful. So, so far we've talked about what chart to choose and the do's and don'ts of how to create that chart. I want to touch on one important point right now about the actual physical process of making the chart. You don't need advanced software to create powerful charts. I think sometimes people can be overwhelmed by seeing fancy charts and think they need a powerful computer or a statistics degree to make them. And I want you to know that you don't. You can use a powerful software to create charts like this, but you can also create them very simply in Excel. Even if you aren't an Excel wizard, it's a pretty user-friendly software, and there are amazing online resources for learning how to use Excel and create the various types of charts. But you don't even need Excel. You can create powerful charts with pen and paper. What's most important, whether you're using sophisticated software like ChartRunner, using Excel, or drawing your own charts, it's important to just keep in mind the guiding principles that we went over to create clean, clear, accurate, and meaningful charts. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the slide deck and the session. I'd just like to spend a bit of time and talk to you about emerging approaches to visual displays of data. So here's something I'm sure people are familiar with. Photo narratives are an increasingly popular way of sharing information. Photos can be a powerful visual display of data. And this, in this example, a team is highlighting the changes on the unit after um, 5 sing their workspace. Another increasingly popular way of sharing information is through infographics. And they can be a very creative way of engaging people with information and combine strong visuals with numbers. And so here's an example of a health infographic conveying information about mental health and addiction. Wordle is another common way of visually presenting data. It's very engaging to convey messages about frequency of data. And Wordle is a tool that generates word clouds from text that you provide. The clouds give greater prominence to words that appear more frequently. So finally, um, something I wanted to share with you, which a colleague shared with me, is the periodic table of visualization methods. This chart offers numerous options for creative ways of displaying information, and I thought it could be a useful resource for you to refer to if you're ever um, looking for new and creative ways to engage your teams with data. And so I've included the web link for this resource at the end of our slide deck. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. Just to recap, uh, we started the session talking about why visual display of information is important. Strong visual display of data is important to tell a story and drive further work. We then got into the what and how. We discussed the five general types of charts and when to use each one. Remember, the chart you choose to present your data depends on the question you're asking. We then went over the do's and don'ts for creating strong charts. The goal is to create charts that are clear, accurate, clean, and meaningful. Finally, I want you to remember that you don't always need special software or even computers to create powerful charts. I know that a lot of your work is done um, with pen and paper, and regardless of the physical way you're creating your charts, always keep in mind the guidelines and tips for creating strong charts. So I want to leave you with a few resources for your own to use. Don't worry about writing these down. Like I said, this presentation will be made available on SharePoint, and so you can grab the information from there. Just a reminder that the Winter Learning Series continues uh, with the next session on driver diagrams on Friday, March 11th. And um, so now we have about 10 minutes left um, in our webinar time, and we'd love to answer any questions you have. So, uh, we love any questions you have about the content of the presentation, but also anything you have about your own experiences in your work with visual displays of data. So I guess we have, you know, okay. So does anyone have any questions or things they'd like to discuss about their own work?
I know a lot of you at the beginning of the session said this is something uh, you're engaged with in your work. You've maybe, maybe struggled to choose the charts um, or which chart to choose. Are there any challenges you can talk about from your own work? Does anyone have any ideas on things that have worked well in creating charts and engaging your colleagues in that data? Don't be shy, people. This is your chance. <laughs> <laughs> we have a whole group of experts here at HQC. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're all experts. We love to engage in discussion. How are people's visual management boards going? Oh, I heard a beep. Is someone joining? Or? I'm just curious with daily visual management, because that's probably the, the most common um, place where we might be seeing a lot of charts and graphs being used. Is Darlene okay. are you still on the phone? Darlene, are you still on the phone? Yes, I'm here. I wondered if you might share any of your insights from Five Hills around your, your use of charts in daily visual management or otherwise. Have you found that uh, efforts to engage uh, frontline or otherwise in terms of uh, data that you've had a lot of success? Or? Um, it's a continuous improvement journey. Yes. Um, so we've been spending a lot of real focused effort on um, talking to our managers and directors about data, about how to use it, how to effectively use it. So just doing a lot of training because we were tracking a lot of data that may not be as valuable. So really trying to teach that and get that on the visual. I can't say that we've had, uh, like that I know of any particular successes, but there's been some mind, mind, uh, mind yeah. shifts of how, what's important, what's not important. What, what kind of uh, charts do you find seem to resonate, or is there a type of chart that seems to resonate more with people? Uh, I don't feel like I, I can answer that. I don't know, because I don't have the answer to that, so I can't. Yeah, well, I'll just tell you why. I'm just you know, curious. Uh, a lot of times we'll see a lot of distribution type charts, so pie graphs, things. People feel quite comfortable with the static data. Um, but then when we move into data over time, that's where people are kind of not, not so sure. Um, so I was just curious if, if there was. Yeah, I do see a lot of pie graphs. I had one training session and I told everybody to bring a graph that they might need improvement on and like half the group brought pie charts. Uh -huh. And okay. all the data was like over time. So they had a pie chart for every month. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so I really encourage them to maybe go a different route to show shifts and trends over time in a trend line. But yeah, people are really drawn to that pie graph and I... Mm. Yeah. Which, you know, it, it does answer a certain question at a point in time. It's, you know, if you have a particular data point, you want to explore what the distribution is, but then what is happening over time? Because of all, all of our work is really, it's, it's, it's um, like processes happen over time. So what is happening when we're trying to improve those processes over time? You're not necessarily going to get the answer just by looking at it at one point. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Sorry to put yeah. you on the spot. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyone else still on the call have anything they want to share? Do we need to see the example of the uh, uh, bar chart with the proportion of people who are thinking about grabbing their next Friday morning coffee? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good one. <laughs> Busy day for people. Yeah. Um, well, if there's no, no other questions or comments, thank you again so much for your time today. Um, and reminder that the next uh, winter learning session is on driver diagrams. Okay. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Enjoy Have a good your weekend. Friday.